Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that our son of man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of living God. And Jesus answered them, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciple to tell no one that he was Christ. It is my belief that this is the climax of the book of Matthew. Matthew wants to present Jesus Christ as the Messiah King. <clears throat> Therefore, he started his book by listing out the genealogy of the King. And then we see the Magi come from the East to worship him. And later on, we see that the herald of the King John the Baptist came and paved the way for him to come. And in chapter 4, we see that the King has been tested like all the Greek kings in the olden days and once he has overcome all the temptation he returned as king <clears throat> once he established <clears throat> his validity he comes in to give his declare his manifesto that who will be able to come into his kingdom and be his subject and after his declaration <clears throat> he basically show his authority and power by performing miracles so after all his miracles, what the reaction from the people, they rejected him. They rejected him, all the people rejected him. In fact, his own hometown rejected him. The leaders from the religious order, Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, all rejected him. Even the Roman Empire, also rejected him by killing his ambassador, John the Baptist. <clears throat> as we say that, J Matthew is to trying to present Jesus as king, but now everybody rejected him. The Jew rejected him, the, the Gentile, the, the, <clears throat> the hometown, his own hometown rejected him, the Roman Empire rejected him. So what's next? How does the story continue? I mean, now he wanted to be king, he came to be king, and now has been all, they all rejected him. Has his plan failed? Has God's plan failed? Everyone rejected Jesus. So what will happen next? What is he going to do? So this text, this text, this chapter here is a watershed, is a pivotal to the whole entire flow of thoughts in the book of Matthew. So what Jesus is going to say in over here, it is. What he's going to do next, what is the plan? In fact, Jesus right here reveal his plan in this passage that what his plan for his church and in fact it's very interesting that the word church is the first time in the book of Matthew that mentioned church in fact Matthew mentioned the word church only three times in the book of Matthew and this is the first time so we will be seeing that 
what Jesus is going to do when all the Jews and the religious order re rejected him. What is he going to do? And, and we told everyone that last week, he's about to embark on the journey to Jerusalem and be killed, be crucified on the, on the, on the cross. So is his plan failed? What is he going to do about this? So this is a very important passage that tells us what Jesus Christ is going to do after he's being killed, how he's going to carry out his plan, and this plan involves the church. So let us dive in and look into what is the Lord is, uh, is going to tell us. First point that he will be telling us is the identity of Jesus Christ. The identity of Jesus Christ. Of course, you look at verse 13. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they say, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he insisted that the disciple give him an answer. He said, but who do you say that I am? Simon replied, you are the Christ, the Son of living God. Last week, we mentioned that Jesus went back to Magadan, where the Jewish people dwell. But what happened after he went back to the Jewish land? Again, he was attacked by the scribes and the Pharisees, by the Sadducees. Now, in this passage, he again withdrew from the Jewish land to the Gentile land up north in the Sea of Galilee. And many scholars believe that what, why he's doing here, what he's doing here is to withdraw from the crowd with the purpose of strengthening his own disciple before he embarked his journey to Jerusalem. So he wants private time. It's a private training for the 12 disciples. And next week you will see that we will be talking about the way of discipleship. Jesus telling them how, how to go about what is disciple and what are they expecting from this disciple? What kind of disciples' life should we have? And after next week, we'll see the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, which is greatly strengthened the disciples' faith. Then you see Jesus Christ trans transfigured into a glorious Son of God. And this all happened in a series of events, and after which you'll see that he embarked on his journey to Jerusalem and finally we know that he will be crucified on the cross so on this today's text he withdrew from the the Jewish land and gone into the mountain and then he basically here he said that he asked his disciple who in fact he asked the disciple twice who do people say that the son of man is in verse 13 and he said again in 15 who do you say that I am? So who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Therefore, I call this sub-point the identity of Jesus. In fact, if we gone through, we preached through John, the, the Gospel of John as well. His contemporary asked the same question. They asked, who do you think this Jesus is and some say he's a good man in John 7 12 he said he's a good man others say no he on the contrary he leads people astray so there there are people who believe him and but there are people who abandon him in fact even his own brother did not believe him while he he was before he go to on on the crucified on the cross and John 10 20 some others say that he has a demon and and some other people still say he's insane but there's still others who's 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 plotting to kill him but here in our text Jesus is asking them who do you think I am what does other people say about me some people say it is John the Baptist, it could be 
Elijah, or it could be Jeremiah, or one of the prophet. But Jesus insists that they give him an answer. Who do you say that I am? So what is your question if Jesus posed a question to you? Who do you say Jesus is? Your answer to this question could change your life and change your destiny. So let us look into verse 15. Verse 15, Jesus asked, said to them, But who do you say that I am? The word, the word you is plural. It's important for you to check this grammar. Jesus is not asking Peter. He's asking, asking the 12 disciples. And Peter basically is a spokesman of the disciple came out. I mean, we have seen Peter did this a lot of time. But Peter came out representing the 12, said, you are Christ, the son of living God. So you, you realize that the question is posed to the group of 12, not just Peter. But Peter is the spokesman. The Peter represent them. Peter came out clearly and said, on, on answer on their behalf, that you, Jesus, he said, you, Jesus, is the Christ. Christ meaning Messiah in Hebrew. Christ is the word they use, Christu, in, in Greek. But at the end of the day, he is the son of a living God. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one, the one that is going to save us. But this is not the first time. This is not the first time that the 12 disciples acknowledge Jesus is the son of the living God. This is not the first time that the 12 disciples acknowledge Jesus' divinity. In fact, if you remember Jesus walked on water and he also asked Peter to come and walk on water with, to, to him. So during that time when Jesus <coughs> came, they saw that Jesus calmed the storm and walked on water. And in Matthew chapter 14, verse 33 said, When Jesus get into the boat, they said to him, Truly you are the Son of God. So this is not the first time that they saw Jesus as God. But having said that, Jesus' answer to them is this. He said to, to them, He said, Simon Peter, because Simon Peter basically representing the, the, the crowd, the twelve, who came to answer on behalf of the twelve, and verse 17, Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, basically you son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This description basically telling us, if you think by watching, by looking, by seeing personally all the miracles, you will come to believe you're wrong. He said that you come to realization that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is not by your naked eyes or how smart you are, how capable you are, how good you are. It's not your capable, your, your intellectual capabilities, but it is God revealing Himself to Simon and of course also to the twelve because when we see that uh, Jesus Christ said in chapter 13 that it is revealed to you but not to others. So in this sense that it is God, the Heavenly Father, to, through the Holy Spirit, reveal Himself to them. Of course, the 12 disciples, including Peter, faith up and down, keep going up and down, up and down, they swing. But nevertheless, they saw that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So you can see that this is because not of human cap capability, but it is basically what God revealed Himself. So because of this, Jesus answered them. How did Jesus put it this way? Look at uh, our, our text, verse 16 or 17, or rather 18. 
Jesus answered him, saying, You are, <clears throat> you are Peter, verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter. On this rock, I will build my church. So, of course, when we come to this text, we have to be very mindful that this text is a minefield in the sen in, in, in last few centuries because the Catholic Church used this to show that Peter is the chosen one, is the one that God chose to be the first Pope. Is he is the first Pope and he become the, the representative of Jesus Christ. But before we go there, I mentioned a little this in the early, <clears throat> in the beginning of this sermon, that Jesus said that on this rock I will build my church. Let me highlight the word church. The word church, it, this is the first time that the church is mentioned here. And, and in the entire book, if you, church is a very important subject in New Testament, but the entire book of Matthew, including the four gospels as well, church is seldom mentioned. Uh, that is something that you have to ponder. And basically, when Jesus Christ mentioned church to the disciple, this should be entirely new concept. The word, the concept of church, it is mystery in your mind. If you remember in Ephesians that some of us are studying Ephesians or finished studying Ephesians, Ephesians basically said that in chapter 3, the, the, the concept of church is a mystery. In uh, Ephesians chapter 3, it said to me that I'm very least of the, all the saints, His grace was given to preach the Gentile, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring light to everyone that is the plan of mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the ruler and authority in heavenly places. The word church or the concept of church was not, it is a mystery, but was not known. And the church include Gentile and Jew. But in the Old Testament, the promise of God, the Messiah only came for the Jew and Jesus Christ himself said only go to the Jew, Jew the Jews do not go to the Samaritan or Gentile but now he suddenly bring out the concept of the church it is something that totally new to them and as I, as I mentioned to you the concept the, the, con, the context become very important that why did Jesus Christ mention church now and the church and in fact all the word church ecclesia in the New Testament all refer to Christian assembling together. So you realize that this is God or Jesus' plan. When he realized, or according to his plan, after he's gone to the cross, this, how his plan is going to unfold is through the church. So, as I mentioned to you, when we start in this sermon, we realize the whole world rejected Jesus, Jew rejected, the Pharisee rejected Jesus. Has God's plan failed? Of course not. But if that is the case, what is next? God's plan is that Jesus revealed the truth that were now carried out by his disciple and his church to the Gentile world. Jesus wanted the 12 disciples to take the gospel to the Gentile and to the world. This is why he, I call that, this is my second point, the instrument of Jesus. Instrument of Jesus. Our first point is the identity of Jesus. The identity of Jesus. And my second point is the instrument of Jesus. Or you can say instrument of Jesus' plan. So when, we, when you look at this text, if you look at this text, especially verse 18 again, 
I tell you, you are Peter, on this rock I will build my church. So what rock? This rock, what rock? This is, this, there are hundreds of pastors, a lot of debates, a lot of books have been written, and this is a minefield through the centuries that how to interpret this rock. So there are many interpretations, but we can summarize into three. Firstly, it can refer to Peter as an individual person. So this is what Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church position, that Peter is chosen one to be the Pope, to represent Jesus Christ from there onwards, and the Pope is basically passed on to the next Pope and, and, and so on. Though this is one interpretation, the second interpretation is referring to Jesus, Peter as the Peter's confession. This rock refers to Jesus' com com confession. We'll, we'll handle the, uh, uh, a little bit in details after I give you the three different interpretations. And the third one is Peter, not just Peter per se, but Peter representing the 12 disciples. Peter representing the 12 disciples. So Jesus Christ is telling you, Peter representing the 12 disciples, will be carrying out, carry out my plan. So let's look into the first one. The first one is that Roman Catholic Church will say that this is Peter, you, on you, I will build my church. But the, the text didn't say, you, Peter, on you, I, I will build my church. This will be a very simple, straightforward answer. But of, of course, a lot of questions hang around two words. One word is Peter, the other one is rock. Uh, rock. The word Peter basically in the Greek is Petros. And the rock is Petras. The word rock, Peter, Jesus Christ said, your name is Simon Peter, or is basically the meaning is rock or stone in that sense. And in, in fact, you must realize that those people who reject Catholic, Roman Catholic's understanding is basically saying that the word Petros is masculine in gender and the, the word for rock is feminine. So these two cannot refer to the same thing. Peter is a man, not a woman. So he said, Peter, you are Peter on this rock, but this rock is a feminine in gender, but Peter is Petros, is, is masculine, so cannot be referring to the same thing. Plus, the word Petros referring to small stone. When Petras referring to massive, large foundational stone or, or rock, in this sense. So it is, this is the point that many, in fact, all the Protestants would disagree with, with the, the Roman Catholic's uh, interpretation because this Peter and the, the rock are two different words. They are not the same. And there are two different words, two different gender, two different meaning. So they cannot refer to the same thing. So the question is that they ask Jesus, you are Peter, on you I will build my church. So especially when we look into this demonstrative pronouns, that's what we call this. Mm -hmm. On this rock, what this referring to? Of course, again, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, interpretation coming out from here. But, of course, later on I will show you that <clears throat> Peter is the representative of the Twelve. Sometimes we call him as uh, uh, the Primus Inter Paris. That's where Li Xianlong uh, said this. If you listen carefully, usually he will say this word. It's basically what we believe in first among equal. Basically, he's saying that the 12 disciples are equal, but Peter is the one who is leading, and we see that all the time. Uh, we, in, in church, we talk about, in church seminar, we talk about this. So when, when we ask the question, what this referring to? It could be referring to Peter as an individual person, or it could be referring to Peter's confession. Peter's confession. So let me 
put it simply, <clears throat> it, can you imagine that Jesus is talking to Peter? So Peter and Jesus is face to face. Or Peter, again, uh, talking to the whole disciple, 12 disciples, with Peter as the leader. So basically, Jesus talking to Peter and say, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. So the question is this. If Jesus wants to say that, you, on this rock, you are Peter, on you, I will build my church. That is the most natural way of understanding. But if Jesus is going to refer to himself, on me that I'm going to build my church, it's also very, very, very natural. But when you say, look at me, you are Peter, I am Jesus Christ, and on this, this is demonstrative pronoun referring to what? Cannot be Peter, cannot be me, it's something else. So many scholars will, will prove that, look, this, this rock cannot be Peter, of course, just now I mentioned that there are a number of reasons that cannot be Peter. But then, it could be me too. But Jesus never used those language. He said, you are Peter, I am Jesus Christ. But this, it has to be. Therefore, Leon Morris is one of the scholars that I respect highly. He said this just pointed out away from both of them. It's a point, something else. So what is the something else? So, Grammatically, the antecedent basically refer back, refer back to what? If we remember the context, the context is this. Jesus said, who do you say I am? And they say, oh, it's Elijah, it's, uh, it's uh, John the Baptist, it's Jeremiah. But Jesus, Jesus said, who do you say I am? He said, oh, you are the Christ, the Son of living God. And Jesus answered them, it is not flesh and blood so revealed to you is God the Father show it to you that on this rock I will build my church therefore this refer to Peter's confession and not Peter's per confession per se is referring to Peter's confession coming from God the Father so it is basically God the Father show you that this true from God the Father that I will build my church so this is one of the, of course, there are many um, different scholars, well-respected scholars have a, a different view. But these are two main ideas that talking about who is this. But regardless, we must say this, Peter definitely, I, I just want to be very clear, Peter is not the untouchable Pope. He is only one of the twelve. And when Jesus Christ said, this rock, he's referring to on this massive foundation, of course, just later on I will show you that. Jesus Christ himself in 1 Corinthians 3 did say that he is the foundation. So he is the foundation, but in this context, he might not referring to himself. He's referring to Peter's confession. But if you look at Peter's confession clearly, Previous companion did say that Jesus Christ is the foundation. He is the son of the living God. Therefore, he is the foundation. So I, I will put in together with the Peter, the confession, together with Christ is the foundation. But in this case, we, we, you will see that basically what Jesus Christ is saying that his confession basically comes from God himself. The confession is the true revealed by God, not his own thinking. So we have to be very clear that when, when it's pointed to this direction, that it is referring to, to Peter. So if we come to, <clears throat> to this text, let me come back to the, uh, the, this context again. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. Let us look at it carefully. He said to them, Jesus said to them, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of living God. And Jesus answered them, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So this is really talking about G Peter's confession. And Jesus immediately answered that, You are Peter on this rock. Okay, what is this rock? Not Peter. 
It is his confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And where this confession comes from, this knowledge of truth comes from, come from God. So because of this, the this referring to back to the confession that Jonah, uh, uh, <clears throat> Peter is, is, uh, is saying. So you, you realize that what he's saying that anyone who confess Jesus Christ is the son of a living God or his divinity is the one <clears throat> that Jesus is saying that on this confession anybody except that Jesus is son of God can be saved can be in, entered into kingdom can, 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 can go up to heaven that is what they are referring to so this has a merit but of course like I say many scholars um, they are they are, on both sides you have very well respect conservative scholar holding the, this position so if you re, if I refer to this as Peter's confession is there any other scripture back this up of course you know sometimes when we study theology we cannot base on one passage or one word or one sentence we have to see where else did the Bible say this in fact there is and in fact again we go back to Ephesians Ephesians is the book on the church and Ephesians said the same thing he said so then you are no longer stranger and alien but you are fellow citizen with the saint and member household of God verse 20 look at verse 20 built on the foundation of apostle and prophet and Jesus Christ himself being cornerstone so here he's talking about the apostle and prophet are the foundation so we're talking about a rock is a foundation rock so can that be referring to what Jesus is saying here on this foundation meaning Jesus saying you will be the foundation for a future church and whatever I tell you remember Jesus said I have a lot of things to tell you you cannot bear it now but when I'm gone the Holy Spirit will come and he will give you what I remind you what I say and then you will pass on this to the church that's why in the book of Acts we see that they didn't devote themselves to the apostle but they devote themselves to the apostles teaching so it is apostles teaching or apostles confession or apostles through that from God that the, the whole church will be built on so that is the, the, the foundation that Jesus Christ is talking about but having said that there are others who point out that Jesus Christ himself said that he himself is a foundation it is true and in fact it's very true that Jesus himself said for no one can uh, this is Paul saying in 1st Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11 for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ so Jesus Christ said I am the foundation but if you look at Jesus uh, Peter's confession Jesus Peter's confession basically said you are the son of God you are the Christ that's why we we we, we <coughs> worship you therefore this is not far away from the truth the truth is that Jesus Christ is God but it's basically coming that on this truth that they built the foundation of course there are other texts especially in in Revelation Revelation say this Revelation chapter 21 say at the end the new Jerusalem coming from heaven and Jules, uh, Revelation chapter 21 verse 10 to 14 said and the wall of the city have 12 foundations and on them there are 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb so now there are scripture backing that the apostle not just Peter alone are the, the foundation of the future church that is what we will see that and I think these, they are, they are they, these are credible that we will believe we will take in this is what Jesus meant on this rock is on the confession of the disciples Peter being the representative of the 12 that on this truth that Jesus Christ is a son of living God not just this one statement but the, all the truth that coming from God through Jesus Christ will be the foundation of the future church
So foundation of Jesus church, then you will realize that Jesus basically said, I will build my church. But of course, at the end of the day, we realize that it is Christ himself will build the church. It's not. It's on what that he's built. From our theology, we understand that it is the word of God, that the revelation of God, the confession, basically in the body of the knowledge from God that the church has to be built, not on the individual person. So just now I, meant, I mentioned that Peter is an individual person, is one explanation. The other one is Peter's confession, but we are talking about the whole body of truth, not just one statement. But then there are other problems, grammatically speaking, Therefore, that we, I present to you the third, pos third possibility is Peter representing the disciples, which we alluded a number of times. Because if you look at this text again, if you look at this text again, he says that you are Peter is a highlight, is an emphatic position. So basically, Jesus Christ, after Peter's confession, Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter on this rock, Okay, you say this rock could be Peter, Peter's confession. I will build my church, Jesus will build his church. Then he said in verse 19, I will give you, singular, the key. So who is having the key? It's Peter. So Peter is actually the prominent of Peter's role in this text cannot be ignored. Cannot be ignored. So the key thing is this, Peter having the key of the kingdom of heaven meaning he can buy and lose that means this power is that's why roman catholic believe that the pope is the only pope say if you are the church if the pope recognizes you are church you are true church if the pope don't recognize you you are not a true church and the, the church have authority to, to declare a person buy or lose that is what what is he talking about but so we have to deal with the issue that peter cannot be ignored the role of the, uh, the emphatic role of Peter in this text. So how do we handle this? In fact, I think it is not very far from what we just said. Peter, because when I mentioned that earlier, Peter said this. When Jesus asked Peter, asked the twelve, who do you is a plural. He asked the twelve, not just Peter, but Peter is representing the twelve. So he is not alone. So when Jesus answered, you Peter, I will give you, but not just you. The same authority goes to all others as well. In fact, if you, if you look at Matthew 18, 18, where we do deal with church discipline, the same phrase will come out. Whoever you bound, you will bind will be bound. Whoever you lose will be loose, loosened or loose. When Jesus used that in, in Matthew 18, 18, the you is plural so the church basically jesus is saying that you are peter i'm going to give you not you but all your 12 disciples not only the 12 disciples all the church is having this power and the power basically rests on the word of god not on the individual person let alone the 12 or any anyone in the church so the understanding is this the church, Jesus Christ is about to go into, to embark his journey to, to Jerusalem to be killed. But he said, right now, before I go, my plan is to have my church get ready. So I'm going to use the 12 disciples, later on these 12 disciples, on their confession. So it is not just Peter per se, but the 12 disciples and their confession that will build the church. That's our understanding. So we see that, first point that in this text, we see that the identity of Jesus for the church, the future church, and the instrument is a 12 disciple with the confession. It's not just one person of the 12, but it's the true, the body of the true that God revealed. Lastly, let us see the intention of Jesus. The intention of Jesus. Now, whatever, because we spend a lot of time on arguing what this rock means, but look at verse 18. Whatever your position is, let me tell you, 
Look at verse 18. And I tell you, you are Peter on this rock. Who will build the church? If Jesus will build the church. I will build the church. So you can say this foundation, this rock can refer to uh, the 12th apostle or Peter or, the, or Peter's confession. But regardless of what, my stand is basically in between the confession, Peter's confession and the 12 disciples. It's the 12 disciples' confession, it's the body of truth, the Bible, the is the foundation of the church. So when we, when we accept that, then we come to the, the key is this. What is the intention of Jesus? Jesus said, I will build my church. I will build my church. It is Jesus built his church, not anyone else. And that is very important. Today, many churches expect the pastor, the elders, the deacons, even the members to build the church. And I have to tell you, this is not what the scripture say. The scripture say it is Jesus Christ himself at the church. That's why just now I show you this, this text. In the book of Acts, he said that the Lord himself added the number to the church day by day being saved. So basically, it is the Lord who built his church, not any one of us. So over here, let us be clear, not the pastor, not the elder, not the deacon, not the member of the church, not the celebrity, not the politician. Of course, there are people, big church, they will find uh, the, the, the movie star to come in or the, uh, the singers to come in and they will attract a lot of people or the politician to come or stand on the pulpit, which a lot of American churches do that. Or the rich or the famous, it is not none of those. The truly saved are Jesus himself add to the church. The Lord himself will add to the church, not anyone else. So if you look at this text, again, you realize that Jesus on the 18th said, I will build my church. And then he's, and over here, verse 18 and 19, you'll see that there are three lessons that we can learn here. I will point out to you, then I'll explain to you one by one. There are three points here about the church. Firstly, the church is very personal to Jesus Christ. Because he said, I will build my church. Not anybody else's church, it's my church. And let's be very clear that. Secondly, he said, my church will prevail over Satan. Thirdly, he said, my church will be authoritative or powerful over the world. This is not too difficult for us to explain. Let me, let me go out over it quickly. So Jesus Christ said that this church will be very personal to him because he said, it is my church. It is Jesus' church. It's Christ's church. It's not yours. It's not mine. It belongs to Jesus Christ. It's his church. Jesus is the head of the church and he is the only savior of the church. He bought the church by his own blood on the cross. So you must remember and we come together, we must always remember that this church belongs to Jesus Christ and we have to honor and worship only Jesus Christ. And when we come to say the church, we are not talking about the building. We're talking about every individual. Everyone is the apple of God's eyes. He looked into everyone and he loved everyone. So when Jesus Christ looked at the church and he loved everyone, he said, this is my church, this is personal. So if that is the case, if that is the case, let me ask you, how would you treat the church? Do you love the church? Do you treasure the church? Do you protect the church? What is your attitude toward the church? This church belongs to Jesus Christ. He is preeminent here and everyone belongs to him. And if you love church, you love everyone that belongs to him. So this is Jesus' church. So when we, when we say our vision, again, our vision is to know him and then we, to be like him and we have to prepare ourselves 
to wait for his return. That is always the church vision or mission. Secondly, you look at verse 18, he said, The gate of hell shall not prevail against it. The gate of hell or gate of haste, basically depending on what version you read, basically is this. Why they use gate? Gate is not offensive weapon. Gate is a defensive weapon. Or, or rather, it's, a, it's for defensive. Gate is to hold somebody back, not to let somebody, not to use the gate to attack anyone. So basically what he's saying is, Satan or hell, or the word, the word haze, basically is talking about hell. Hell will not able to hold on to their members. When the gospel comes, they will be able to take people out from hell. Meaning, Jesus Christ's gospel come, he will be able to save people out from hell, and they will not withhold his powerful enough, he will have victory over Satan, over death, then he will rescue people out from death. So we are talking about the power of the gospel. We are talking about the power of the gospel that even hell cannot hold on to their, the, the people. If Jesus Christ's church would prevail over them, have victory over them, therefore, when church come together, church will have victory and church will, will finally prevail. And that is our faith in church. So no one can overcome the power of the church and the church will prevail to the end. And last point here, the power of the world. The church will have power or authority over the world. In fact, look at verse 18 again. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What does keys of the kingdom of heaven mean? Basically, key in the ancient world is the authority or permission. When you have the key, you can open and close. So basically, you have the authority, meaning that you have the authority over who you will buy and who you will lose. In fact, here, who will you buy and who will you lose belongs to Peter. But again, we say not just Peter, but the twelve, but not just the twelve, but also the, the, the church. Because when it comes to Matthew 18, 18, you will realize that he's referring to the church. Meaning that the, if we understand it correctly, the church have the genuine gospel. The gospel, when you preach to someone, that someone believes, you will be loose, loose from, from the grip of hell or the grip of Satan. And you will be released. So the power is in the gospel is, and the gospel is inside the church. And the church is supposed to take this gospel and preach it to everyone in the world. And of course, I, I do not want to go into uh, too technical here because in fact this text is very technical because it said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth shall be loose in heaven. This translation may not be the best translation because the word whatever you buy on earth shall be bound is basically a perfect tense in Greek meaning already done not because so the question is this you mean the church is so powerful that when when the church buys someone then God will have to buy someone so God is reacting to the church decision it is not basically the, the Greek is basically is the church is binding someone because already has been bound Meaning, the church saw that understanding the will of God. If you preach to somebody, someone believe in, in Christ and the Son of the living God, he is already loose. If, you, if he reject, he's already bound. So all this already done in heaven, rather the church is reacting to God's guidance rather than the church take the lead and God only reacting to what the church do. So that is... Uh, technical, but of course, I, I, I think we do not dwell that. So let me conclude. This text, how important is this text? This text is very important because he tell us when Jesus go to the cross, it's not the end of the story. He already tell us there's new leaf of life. Once is Jesus on the cross, the disciples are to take this confession or this truth that belongs to God to take this 
to the Gentile world and to the whole world. And whoever believes, he will be loosed from hell. And whoever rejects, he will be bound in hell. And this is what the church is, is uh, supposed to do. So if we understand that it is talking about the disciples reveal truth, then we are talking about the Bible. If there is a case, then the Bible is given to us. We are built, all the church, all the members are built on the Word of God and, his, and we will share the Gospel of God and the Word of God to others and whoever obey, they will be loose. Whoever reject, they will be bound. And this is not difficult to understand. So the question is, since everybody rejected Jesus Christ, has God's plan failed? Obviously not. Jesus has planned after his crucifixion of the cross. Because he showed the people, showed the 12 disciples who Jesus is. He is the son of the living God. He is the Messiah. Even the whole world rejected him. But he is very firmly fixed, understand that he is the Messiah. And his instrument for the church is basically the 12 disciples and the church. And his intention is this, he himself will build the church, not any one of us. So we have to trust in him and we have to take his word seriously, including the whole Bible. Then we will build on this church, we are, our, our church will be built up by this truth, the Bible. Then we will become the, the representative of our Lord. So I hope that we understanding, of course I know that this text can be very difficult and there are many, many questions and I'm sure that a small group leader will be able to explain some of this, uh, your answer. But I think this text give us, give me confidence. God's plan will not fail. It give me confidence, it give me hope, it give me joy. Jesus will prevail as well as the church will prevail, will have victory. Shall we pray together? Father, we come before you. We want to thank you for giving us this text. I know it's very premature that we talk about this very plan of yours before Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. But as we see that it's already revealed throughout the pages of the scripture that you will build your church. And although at Matthew 16 is a future tense, but we understand your church will be built on the word of God and it will not fail. Therefore, we will study your word. We will memorize your word. We will uphold your word and obey your word in such a way that we will give you honor. May we be grounded in your word and pray that you be glorified in our life. May you build our church for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.